Hey everyone, I'm live right now with Lesha. Is it Harhai? Harhai. Har Harhaj. Okay, Lesha with Lesha. Lesha is our director of career success at Full Stack Academy and Grace Hopper. And I thought today would be fun to talk about really, you know, hiring days, how they've turned virtual, and really how to crush it at a hiring day. So how to do really well at one and uh, and stand out. So, so Lesha, why don't you allow yourself? Um, or why don't you introduce yourself, uh, what you've been up to, and um, and yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts on hiring days and then what it's like to do a virtual one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, David, first of all, for having me join. Definitely um, exciting to be at my first full stack fireside chat. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Lesha Harhai, as David mentioned. I'm the director of career success for the Full Stack Academy and Grace Hopper programs. Um, I've been with Full Stack a little bit less than a year. It'll actually be a year in May. And I came um, from a background in campus recruiting and higher education, um, was at NYU for 10 years working in career development. So I've been very excited to be a part of the full stack team guiding um, our students and working with our employers as they finish program and find jobs. I actually love hiring days. I love them virtually. I love them in person. I think they are such a unique opportunity for employers and candidates to connect on a face-to-face, in-person level. Conversations, while you know there are some scripted questions that people follow, can be really spontaneous. Um, and I think we've seen that evolve in the last couple of weeks as companies and organizations have had to transition to more virtual formats. Colleges and universities are doing that. We're certainly doing that here at Full Stack. Um, we're actually going to be hosting our next virtual hiring day for New York next Tuesday um, and for Chicago next Thursday. Any employers out there, we're still taking registrations. Um, so reach out to me to register. But I think this is really a great opportunity to allow employers and candidates to still engage and move hiring processes um, along. And that face-to-face -face interaction doesn't change, whether it's in-person or whether it's virtual. So I think it's a great um, connector for, for everyone going through this process. I'm curious how, you know, you, you talked more with employers than, uh, than anyone. How is, how is their response been to, uh, to joining something like a virtual hiring day? Yeah, I have to say it's been really positive. You know, I think right now organizations are evaluating their recruiting and hiring needs. And for the ones that still have a volume um, to hire, we've seen a lot of companies actually increase their hiring based on the industries that they're in. They've really jumped at this opportunity. I think they see this as a way not to break um, the processes they've already had in place um, because they still have to onboard these people and hire great talent. So the employers that are gonna be joining us We've just had to kind of describe to them what our process is going to be, how the day will be run itself. But we've had, um, you know, people who are really excited to be to be joining us once we've given them all of the details. Okay, yeah, that's awesome to hear. I think um, one of the things that I love about hiring day too is is the bustle of the room. But oftentimes it becomes hard to hear. And in Zoom, you do have the privacy of you know being in that breakout room or being in that session by yourself. So it is a it's a very different experience. So you lose some of that energy, but you gain. Um, the ability to hear hear everybody a little easier. So yeah, there's definitely the volume. It is kind of like a white noise situation when you're in the room all together. But you know, I think this will give out you know candidates and employers the ability to also drill down into conversations a little bit more in depth, which is really what the point is. Yeah. So Alesha, you're pretty popular. A lot of viewers. Um, yep. <laughs> so uh, me and Emmett will we'll live stream all night and there'll be like a, one person watching. But, you know, that's fun for that one person and us. Uh, so, of course, if you're out there, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, post them as a comment and uh, we can answer them live on um, on the stream. But otherwise, we're going to go over three, uh, three to four sections, right? We'll start with how do you pitch yourself? Because I feel like in the job fair, in the hiring situation, you got to be so succinct, you gotta get right to the point. Um, so yeah, so let's just love like, what is our talking points on really pitching yourself and making yourself stand out right in that? Because um, we our students typically have about 10 minutes, right? So this is speed dating, job searching. So what is that moment? What is that way that they can really uh, stand out when they, someone asks, tell me about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. We first tell students, think about it as a rubber band. You want to make it short, you want to make it sweet, and you want to make it, make it flexible. You want to be able to make it adaptable um, to the situations that you're going to be in, and that depending on how the question, tell me about yourself, is asked, you may have to change your pitch um, a little bit. But there are three key factors that you want to keep in mind. You want to refer to your past, your present, and your future. So what have you done what are you doing and what do you want to do? And that's really your pitch in a nutshell because it covers your past experience. So whatever professional career you had beforehand, 
what you're doing currently now. So for our students, the fact that they're going to be boot camp graduates, and what do you want to do? What are those dream companies you want to work for? What are those dream apps you want to build? Where do you see yourself evolving in the technology space? Because that will also give an employer some in-depth experience and knowledge into what you're interested in doing post boot camp. So what I'd love to hear is a you, what do you think a stellar pitch is for a bootcamp grad? Like, like, kind of b- pick a bootcamp grad in your you, uh, in your mind and give a stellar pitch for them. Then I'd love to share one for yourself, and and maybe I'll try one as well. Yeah, absolutely. I have to say, one of the best pitches I um, heard actually came from one of our most recent Grace Hopper graduates. She was actually a farmer um, in her previous career and used that as part of her pitch to say she worked in farming, was really interested in sustainable agriculture, and she decided that she wanted to determine technological solutions for how to make agriculture more sustainable. Um, so that's why she enrolled in the Grace Hopper program and that she was really looking to work for mission driven organizations based in agriculture culture to help them come up with techno- technological technology based solutions that they could implement in their businesses. Okay, that's that's interesting. I, I did not know we had farmers in our program. That's that's it's fascinating. Yeah. So yeah, so so Lesha and then let's see. Let's let's give your what what's your pitch if someone says Lesha tell me about yourself. I know you introduce yourself, but Yeah, so my pitch would be is that I'm a higher education and career development professional. I spent 10 years in career development at NYU before coming to lead career services at Full Stack Academy, where I meet with employers and students to connect them in a way that's going to get them job placement post-program. I look to continue in this industry, working with our partners um, to promote their opportunities to learn more about the technology sector and share that information with our students. All right, very nice. I think for, for myself, when I was when I was early in my, I mean, founders, I find it hard to pitch myself because well, um, each founder, uh, each executive role seems like I, it's hard to apply for CEO job at another company. Uh, but I've always said that you know, I I spent my career building technology teams at startups, um, scaling from you know ten to a hundred people, and I love creating great teams that built on process, delivering high business and product value. And for me, that was my always thought was like, I want to put it into a niche and I want to to own that niche. Right. And so, um, and for me, the future of what I want to do is I want to help you get your engineering team and get our company to that next level where we can, um, you know, raise additional funding, grow additional number of users, et cetera, and build the, build the right infrastructure for that process. Right. Great. The, um, okay. So the past, present, future, what do you think are some paths that um, sound particularly good? And what do you think are some paths that, you know, don't necessarily um, maybe you should not like emphasize as much? Yeah, I think definitely, you know, I think the thing that we talk about in the full stack community a lot is that all of our students came to us having had a life before coming into full stack. That is definitely something that you should underscore because most employers are going to be really interested in why you decided to come into a software engineering boot camp. Some people have had tech backgrounds where they've worked in tech, but not necessarily as as a web developer or an engineer. Others who have worked in financial services or law or have done a million different things. So I often feel like past experience is always really good, especially if it's what you were doing in maybe the two to three years before you decided to come to full stack. I usually tell students that you don't necessarily need to go back way into your past. So that first job that you got in high school or college, or if you were a lifeguard or a babysitter, those are things you don't necessarily need to include in your pitch. You really want to stay focused on your professional experiences and how they led you into your journey um, here at Full Stack. So uh, two questions. One is, how do you think about branding? So for example, I think there are some the way I think about it, there are some brands that people can kind of place you, right? So if you go into an Ivy League school, you said, I went to I went to Harvard for my undergrad. Mm-hmm. That kind of says, okay, whenever I hear that from someone, I'm like, okay, this person was, at least at minimum, I know they were very good at high school and that they, they're hardworking um, and able to do well on standardized tests, which are all positive attributes, right? So what are some of the brands that you think are, you know, how do you think about emphasizing your past brands? And another thing I'd love to get your thoughts on is, um, what is it? What is the tone like? Should someone be? Because I think one thing's hard for people to sell themselves, right? So say like I'm X Y Z. People kind of, you know, we are. We try to be more humble most of the time, but this one, do you think we? How do you go a little bit over the top? What does that sound like? Yeah, I absolutely. I tell everyone that I kind of work with all the time that the only person who's going to advocate for you as well as you are 
is is you. You have to just be out there and say, this is your opportunity to introduce yourself. People want to get to know you. They want to know who you are, what your brand is. And that can take time to develop. I think that's why we encourage, and especially at Full Stack, for students to work with their career coaches to develop this. They're not working on their pitches independently. They come with drafts and we say them out loud and we, you know, they talk to each other and in the mirror and all of these things. So I think branding is very important. And I think you have to understand your own why about why did you decide to come to full stack? Why was it a change that you wanted to make from what you were doing before? And then that's how you can choose, you know, the brand that you want to bring in with you and the transferable skills that you're also bringing in. I think one of the defining things that we talk about for our students when they are in a virtual hiring day environment is that don't be ashamed of what you were doing before because everything that you did before <laughs> led you to where you are right now. And it is undoubtable that you've already used some of the skills you may have used in previous experiences to become successful in full stack, whether it's working on your teams, you know, designing your own capstones, doing pair programming, all of those attributes from your personal and um, professional previous experiences will get um, put through. As for tone, I think tone is really important. Everybody knows whether you're an interviewer or an interviewee, you have to be selling yourself at any given point. So having an upbeat tone, being proud of what you've done and understanding that you still have a lot to go is a great way to spin your um, pitch when you're talking to a potential employer in a virtual hiring day environment, saying, you know, I've, I'm confident in what I did before. I've just completed this great experience and I'm confident in those skills. I may be a little nervous about what's coming next, but I feel prepared and ready to start exploring um, those new experiences. So being, you know, kind of fake until you make it a little bit Oh, yeah. helps some some of that confidence, especially for students who may be a little bit nervous about using that pitch for the first time. And what do you say to a student who, because I think, you know, there's some backgrounds where, hey, let me, let me talk this up, right? Like I got a math undergrad. Um, and then before that, I was a product manager at Google, right? That person has a pretty good previous pitch. I would even think someone who was in retail or someone who was a, um, like a server at a restaurant. Yeah. How do you connect that experience to, to where they're going? Yeah, I definitely always encourage them, um, people relations because you are never gonna be working on your own. I think some of our students who have worked in retail or worked um, in the service industry are actually some of our most successful because they already know how to talk to other people. And that no. what work you're doing is fundamental. And I think it's actually one of the things we see so much from our full stack um, and Grace Hopper grads because they've got those people skills that make them likable in that environment. And I tell them too, you no, know, those people skills are gonna come out in your interview, not just when you get hired, but knowing how to talk to someone is a really valuable skill and being able to adapt and answer questions quickly, all of those things will benefit you when you're talking to employers. Yeah. I think one of the things I heard once was that like, you know, I, someone was embarrassed about, not embarrassed, but they, they didn't like, I don't want to talk about my previous server industry, my previous experience as a server. But then we were digging into it, I was like, you know, they would consistently earn some of the highest tips at their restaurant. And I was like, that's a great point because that's that shows that you are the kind of person who can connect with others. And the one trend I've noticed in the last 10 years is that technology is not so much now a solitary event, right? It is, as it's, it's integration of so many things, design, product, um, and, you know, even things like solutions engineering, right? It's a whole new role that we think about how do you onboard technical products? So being able to, to connect with others is a lot more important now than, hey, I, I know how to, you know, it's no longer where I know how to connect like these arcane symbols. And so, you know, hire me to be like the wizard in the high tower, right? There are, there are roles like that, but they're much more rare than the kind of roles that are growing where we need to connect with everybody. Uh, we need to connect with others and provide value to the business that, that's visible. Yeah, so many of our employers come back and say to us that the reason why Full Stack and Grace Hopper students are successful is because they've got those people skills. So they're not afraid to talk to clients. They're not afraid to talk to other people on, on the team. So we really feel like that's such a strong attribute that you shouldn't shy away from. You know, everybody learns those experiences. Some of us learn it at, in higher ed. Some of us learn it in fraternities and sororities. Some of it, some of us learn it in the part-time jobs that we're in. But all of those skills are really important. And if, as long as you can relate it, to what that employer is asking you to do, it would, it's always a solid example to provide. The um, the one thing I was thinking about is is how do you practice this pitch? Like, if you had to give like, what's the what method that people should be doing before they go into a job fair? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I am a little old school. I write everything down. Um, so I remember when I was preparing to, to go to career fairs and virtual career fairs when I was in, in undergrad is that I would actually write down my bullets. I would write down past. What are the things that I wanted to highlight? Present, future. And then I would write some sentences out from that. I would caution everybody, make sure you don't sound robotic when you're doing that. But for me, that was really helpful in terms of organizing my thoughts and what I wanted to focus on and keeping it short, sweet um, and flexible. So we've definitely got exercises that we help students focus on when they're in program. Um, they're always taking notes and some of them are reading it off their iPhones. Um, so do whatever works best for you, but look at it as a way to organize your thoughts before you're going in and meeting someone. I'm a big believer in this, um, what I call like the initial dip of, of skill in the sense that if I, I often think to myself, you know, I'm going to go give a talk. If I just go up there and wing it, I'll do like, you know, a six out of 10. If I practice it two times, I'm going to do a two out of 10 because I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to be like trying to follow these notes. And it takes me quite a while before I'm back above where I would if I had just, just wong it i don't know if that's a word but um if i just winged it so i, I think yeah it, it, it did something that i recommend that you i do notice people who go and they're very robotic to practice a few times record yourself and and at the end of the day like what my, my favorite trick is to i write it down fully out recite it and before you know it i, I write just down the bullet points and then before i don't then i don't need the card at all so i think that's that's how i recommend it. it's just you shouldn't it shouldn't be something that you are reciting from memory at the end of the process. Also, I mean, it's about yourself, right? You should be able to talk about yourself. I, I don't know why people find it so uncomfortable to talk about themselves. Um, it's it's a learned you know, it's a learned thing. It's like the same it's thing. A skill, right? It's definitely a skill because people don't want to feel like we're inherently we don't want to feel like we're bragging. But I have told countless yeah. people that it's not bragging. You're just telling somebody about the things that you did. If you went on and said I was the best student ever to come out of Full Stack Academy ever. That might be a little bit bragging, but if you just yeah. say, I'm a proud graduate of Full Stack Academy in the Grace Hopper program, that's not bragging. That's merely a statement. So yeah. I always say, think about it in statements and, and you know, I think you'll, you end up in the, in the direction that you want to go in. This is a little bit of an improv question, but do you, I would think about like writing, what are the hooks that get into someone's mind? So what are the hooks in your pitch that oftentimes people can cling onto that make them like that give them a chance to ask you the next question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think some of the hooks are depending on questions at the end. You know, sometimes it'll be like, I would love to hear your pitch. Can you give it to me? And I've been, I've actually had that come back to me as an interviewer and have been so like was so caught off guard, even as someone who's in career development, um, who's used to giving pitches just on the fly um, that I've definitely, I think I've hired every candidate who's ever asked me that question. Um, because All right, there you go. Them, Power tip. You're countering them back. So I think that's, that's a good um hook in terms of it i think for some of our engineering candidates it's you know what's your favorite language and why it really depends on what the hook goes back to and i think people or what was the first programming language that you started out with and that brings people back to their own past and how far they've come in their careers um so those are a couple that i think can definitely spurn the next conversation you want someone and you also kind of want to see are they actively listening to you when you're giving the pitch um as well so by following up with a question, you're also kind of getting them involved in the conversation. All right, awesome. Let's, next time I'm gonna move on to researching the role in company. Uh, Nimit and I made a video about this topic, uh, which <laughs> I thought was, I, I hope it wasn't too creepy. I, and I, I don't know anyone at that firm. I, I know one of the investors in that firm, so maybe I'll send it to him and be like, this is um, okay with this. But I'm curious, you know, what are the things that someone should know about a company going into interview? Because oftentimes they're not, you know, you might be, let's think you have, if you go to a job fair, you might, there might be 20 companies that are there, 20 to 50 companies you want to interview. So you can't devote that much time to interviewing each one. You can't like dive deep. What are the kind of, what are the surface level things that people should know about companies and the companies they really like, how should, how can they go deeper? Yeah, absolutely. I always tell students, if you're given in um, that information in advance, who's going to be at the fair that you're going to be attending, you will inevitably run out of time. So for, you know, all the fairs that we've run, information sessions that we've done, you will never get around to as many companies as you, as you want. So I always tell people, make a priority list. Make a priority list of the five companies that are your absolute have to talk to, and then add an additional five um, or 10 to that though, that list, depending on the size of the event, because you may want to go to a first one company and the line may be a little bit too long. You kind of need to recircle, 
redirect your efforts. So kind of be prepared in that regard. And that's how you should base um, your kind of research gathering. So the first thing is, is definitely Google the company. I always recommend to students on the days of career fairs or interviews, virtual interviews that they are having, Google the company and see what the main news headlines for those companies were. We definitely see companies going public. We see them um, getting bought out. We see them getting merged. You know, those things might have an impact on how the business is going to be run and the work that you might eventually be doing. So it's really great to walk into an employer and have a follow up question be, I just saw that this happened today. How do you think it's going to impact the business in the short term, in the long term? And that signals to an employer that you're interested in the growth of the organization and that will show your interest in the organization. Um, as well. Hey, I can't I can't stress how important that is that when I hear a candidate who we're interviewing that knows the last news article that hit about our company, I'm like, well, this person is is really awake on this role, right? They're not just kind of interviewing to interview. Um, and so I think, yeah, knowing that last headline, because I think one thing, I, the way I'll share is that we make a big deal out of when we have positive headlines or negative headlines, addressing the whole company and saying, this is what happened. Here's what we're were they really proud of this or we're really, you know, here's how we're responding to this, this event, right? And so everyone in the company will have that as a same note. And if you can echo that note to them, it's very powerful in terms of making you feel like you're already part of their, you know, part of their clan. So I can't emphasize like knowing the last few headlines on a, on a company is a big thing uh, to make yourself stand out versus the person. I mean, the other people aren't terrible, right? But it's like, they always feel like you're an outsider. We have our inside stories. As soon as you talk about the inside story, um, it, it changes the feeling, changes the dynamic. Yeah. You really want to go and kind of, and, you know, determine what it would be a part of to be like of that organization. And, and to your point, if you were part of that organization, you would hopefully be aware of that headline. So it's already kind of showing how you're trying to fit into company culture, which is really important. Um, another thing that you should be doing, which candidates often don't do, and I strongly encourage, make sure you're actually looking at the job description for the role that you're applying for. Sometimes in virtual hiring days or virtual career fairs, the information can be very general, but employers often do provide the specific role that they're recruiting for. Some companies may be there for general recruitment and many different business lines. It's hard to prepare as specifically, but try to do a little bit about what the open roles are in those specific business units. But for the specific roles, so for example, at our Full Stack Academy hiring day on Tuesday, we've had our organization send us um, the direct links for what they're going to be recruiting for on that specific day. We share those out with our students in, in a cheat sheet that we give to them um, with that information. And the number one thing is say, read the job description. Ready, start connecting your experience to what that job is asking for so that when you get to talk to that employer, you're able to make a specific connection between a project that you worked on or a stack that you were um, programming in because that's going to also show the employer that you've got an understanding of what the job may require and how your skills would be a potential fit for that. Yeah, one thing one thing I, I like doing, and we talked about in the other video, is trying to figure out a company's technology stack by digging into the engineers on that team, right? Because oftentimes our job description will say we'd use XYZ technology, but they won't expand further on you know, what, what databases they use or what infrastructure components they use. Uh, but if you dig into the engineers, you very quickly find out you know, I'm a world-class expert in Kubernetes, right? They wouldn't have hired that person unless they have Kubernetes issues or I'm an expert in MongoDB. So I think digging into those things is, is helpful so you, you know uh, what the technology is like and and make those connections. Um, yeah. And then I yeah. Also, like you want to research also the people that you're going to be meeting with is that in some cases you'll get a list of participants. You know, we give that information out to our students because we want them to be well researched and well prepared. So a little light LinkedIn stalking is never a bad thing. Um, there are premium accounts for you can do this. You can turn in your own LinkedIn profile, getting to know someone's background. You know, I know David, you and I have have talked about it. And I remember, you know, I did my research on you before we sat down for our interview and, and learning commonalities was a way that we built rapport. Um, and those are always things that, that recruiters and, and interviewers remember. Someone who in a non-creepy way looks to see maybe they have you know, colleagues in common. Maybe they went to the same undergrad. Maybe they were part of the same fraternity or sorority. These are things that build rapport um, and that, again, make you also stand out when you're one candidate amongst um, a lot of different ones. All right. Um, any Anything else? Like if you, for the companies that you're passionate about, anything else, like any other tips for going a little bit deeper than um, on a specific company? 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that for the companies that you're passionate about, um, I think there are definite, you know, I think Google's actually got a great tool where you can actually go back in time and see what the Google search results were at any particular history in time. So one of the things that I actually really like to do is go back and look at what a company was doing on the first day that it came out or the first day that a project launched and be able to bring up and say, you know, so in doing my research, I saw these things. How has this project evolved? Is this something that we even do? anymore mm. evolved in that. So that's a little tip that I love to use, especially when it's a company that you are like, I would give my, you know, right arm to be at this place because this is what I want to do. And I've seen the growth of this organization. So it's those little things that show an employer that you are invested in understanding who they are and what they're doing and showing that you want to be an integral part of that community. Yeah. I like that tip. I, I've never thought about that before, but kind of following up on their, historical press is interesting because they, sometimes it makes them stop and think of, you know, how is that going here? And, and, uh, and how do you even know about that? Right. Yeah. It definitely, right. It's been an impressive technique to use for some more senior level managers, the people who've been at companies at a long time, especially those who have seen it, you know, it evolve over the years. So it gives them the opportunity to stop and think and be like, we've, we've really come a long way and that's kind of cool. And this person made me think about that. All right, you know, one next thing I'd like to go over is the uh, three most common technical interview questions. And I think here is, you know, typically you have at most two to 10 minutes to meet with a company here. So there's not, they can't ask you how to, you know, solve complex problems. So what are the things that, um, that companies typically ask in a interview, in a, in a job fair type situation? And how should people think about what, like, what, what makes an answer a good answer? Yeah, I would say overall, what makes a good answer a good answer is understanding the projects that you've worked on and understanding, can you clearly articulate the languages that you were using, why you made decisions that you that you made, conflicts and problems that you ran into and how you resolved them over time. I have never met an engineer who has said any project has worked cleanly from the first time we ever used it. Um, so keeping those things in mind when you're talking about your technical experience is really important because most oftentimes you're going to be talking to someone who has a technical proficiency, whether it's an engineer on the team, um, technical recruiters, you know, certainly hiring managers and directors of team. They're going to they've been where you are before they have been in that junior role. So they know that everything doesn't necessarily work out the, the best way the first time. So they're they're wanting to hear about how you work through some of those problems. So I would say. Definitely the top three questions that we see is describe your project. A fundamental mm -hmm. aspect of full stack is the capstone project. Um, our employers who hire full stack grads know that you're working on a capstone. So being able to talk about what the project was, why you decided to choose it, if it was solving a business need or a problem, or if it was just a cool game that you came up with, and your role on that particular project. That I think is the defining question that we always encourage students to answer. What significant contributions did you play in getting that project off the ground? Because at the end of the day, even if it was a team effort, the employer is going to want to know what you did because you're the person who's telling them about that particular project. So always make sure, and again, not bragging, but if you basically coded the entire front end and got you know the shopping carts to work to be able for products to come through, um, that's not bragging. It's really just stating what you were doing on, on that project. Yeah, I like that. Um... A lot of these questions, as I think about this, they're trying to understand how you make judgment calls, right? Because there is a there is a part of programming that is, look, I need to do a loop here, and that's just that's like the technical answer to this problem, right? And then there's a part of like judgment of like, should I integrate this technology? Should I integrate this library? Should I integrate this particular, you know, algorithm? And thinking about that and knowing like being able to quickly understand, okay, here's what the algorithm solves. Here's a problem set is a, I would say it's what differentiates people who are, um, I don't even say junior and senior, because I'm like, that's a dichotomy. I think I would say like problem solvers versus, you know, people who like to sling code, right? Because like a lot of people is like, oh, this is really cool. Let me just throw this in here. And because I think it's I'm something I'm excited about. And oftentimes as a, as an engineering manager or as a, a program like you know someone who's even disconnected from the engineering management that's frustrating because it's more solutions to problems solutions to problems i don't have rather than uh, solutions to problems that that are uh, helping me grow the business all right so, so the first question is describing your project 
how you make those judgment calls. Um, what about, okay, what's, what's uh, question number two? Number two would be what architectural decisions have you made? How did you decide um, to come up with those things? I think this goes back to what we were just saying. Employers want to see problem solving. They understand that the projects that you worked on might not have any direct impact on what their business line is. But again, the thinking, how you decided to um, architect your decision is going to be something that's really fundamentally important to them because it's going to show them that you can architect decisions for you know potential projects that you might work on as, a, as an employee of their organization. Um, so I think that one's definitely really important and one that we see um, frequently um, because our employers are evaluating so many different projects of our students. And then I would sorry. Think, yeah, no, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I, I know the coughing right now is like uh, is is such a scary sound. So I want to make sure I mute it. No. The third question, you know, I I see this question pop up all the time, and um, I would love. To, so the question, the third question, I think we want to talk about is uh, sometimes people just ask, "Tell me how the internet works." So I'm curious why you think people ask this question and what a good answer is. Yeah, I think people sometimes ask this question because they think it's like the least common denominator of like a brain teaser. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think I think engineers and, and we, we definitely had employers see that sometimes you want to throw out these brain teaser questions. Again, you just want to see how people think and you want to understand, like, can someone tell you a story in an answer? Because that's really what interviewing questions are, is taking the question, understanding what the employer is trying to ask you and then telling them a story um, around it. So I think we've seen people come up with, you know, relatively creative solutions. Sometimes they're thrown by that question. Sometimes they're like, I have absolutely no idea how the internet works. But depending on how you answer the question, it can actually be impactful to, to an employer. I think from the engineering standpoint, understanding how the internet was created, how things are connected. Um, again, showing someone how you think constructively and strategically resonates to the employer. And for people who have been like, never thought I was going to get answered that question, coming up with something that is at least trying to get to the right answer and humorous in some perspectives has worked really well um, for candidates as well. Because I think sometimes software engineering managers understand that there are ridiculous brain teaser questions, but they also want to make candidates a little bit uncomfortable sometimes and see how far you can stretch an answer and where where you'll go and develop something. You know, I think that's something, this question, as I think about it, because there's a there's a joke amongst physicists. It's like, well, how do you start with, how do you make an apple pie? And the answer is, well, first you start, you create a universe, right? And the, the, the among programmers, I think this is one thing I don't love. Well, I don't know if I don't love it or not, but one thing I've noticed about program interviews is that they often are as much technical challenges as they are cultural challenges, right? Like we're part of an in-group and are you, a part of our in-group, right? And even the technical questions can sometimes lean this way because I, I think that if I ask you how to reverse a linked list, first of all, no one ever does that. Second of all, it's it, it has a trick in it. And like the trick is like the secret handshake. Because once you know the trick, then you can do it, right? It's like, then it's just kind of memorizing memorizing the trick, understanding the trick and applying it. And I often think that um, the... So, so that's what I don't love. I don't love like some of these uh, cultural challenges. This one to me seems a little bit kind of in the between because it's a little bit of a history lesson, right? But I think what it gets at is we are, we are, we stand upon the shoulders of giants in the sense that if you say how does the internet, how does the internet work, right? You have to start with, well, if you're a physicist, you have to start with how to first make a universe. But if you're a computer scientist, it's like, well, first you're sitting on something like networking, right? All of networking was invented, which is it's, it's amazing to think about that we can stream Netflix down like a copper wire, the size of you know, um, the, the size of a telephone line. So I think that is um, is a little bit like, do you understand the, how many layers are there on the internet? Do you know the names of those layers are? Because then, do you know the layers that you're building on, right? So, if I say that, if you only know the React layer, you don't even know the JavaScript layer. That's concerning, right? If you don't know JavaScript, it's on top of well, how do program languages underneath that work? I don't think you need to know the answer, but to understand that it's there, and also it's a curiosity test, right? Are you curious how this all works? So, and I'm I have to look around because I, I would love to find what a, what's a good answer for someone to answer this because the answer can be very. I think you're right. It has to be a little bit humorous because the question itself is humorous because it's so broad, right? Yeah. It's like um, the, yeah, but I, I would say like the few things is testing. One, are you curious about how this stuff is worked, right? Because are you the kind of person who installs a library and then just uses it? Are you, do you ever open the hood and say, hey, how is, 
the React engine works, right? How does, um, like, what's what's Redux doing? What is this library I'm using? How's it working? That's a, a positive trait. And then the second thing is, are you aware of how many layers that you stand upon? Um, because it is it is a lot. Um, so I think, and I think the reason that is important is because it, um, we sit upon all these abstractions and sometimes the abstractions can break down. And so people who don't know that the abstractions are even there, they don't know when they break. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's definitely so, you know, I think the employers who ask these questions also, it is, I think, going back to what you said, a little bit of a cultural tool. I think, I think these were things that have been historically asked in some really kind of premier um, software engineering interviews and, and other companies felt like maybe I should be asking these types of things as well. I will definitely say in a virtual hiring day environment, because it's so quick, by the time that everybody's kind of introduced themselves and gone over that, tell me about your question, you're not really gonna be getting a lot of substantial technical interviewing um, questions. So I always encourage students in this situation, make sure you know your resume, Make sure you're focusing on yourself, the languages that you've worked in, the projects that you've developed, what your contribution was to that. And then always know that there's going to be additional technical assessment as you continue on in an interview process. You may get some of more of these brain teasers going down, but it's not highly likely that you're going to get a ton of technical, very in-depth technical questions during a very quick virtual hiring day. Um, environment. Also, you know, once we hopefully return to kind of in-person um, hiring days, we really don't have anyone like getting up and, you know, whiteboarding um, during during our hiring days. Um, they might scribble some stuff out on some paper, but it's not a really kind of uh, full-on technical assessment. Yeah, I, I think you, you always think about like, what am I trying to get done here, right? And in 10 minutes, I'm trying to get to that next meeting, right? right? And so, so let's take a quick break before we dive into the behavioral questions. We have a question from the audience. Um, uh, how do how do you succeed in interviews that last three to four hours, or in some cases, the full day? Any, any thoughts on, so this is obviously not related to a virtual hiring days, but uh, any thoughts on doing what, because these are, these are tiring. And I remember, I don't know if, um, I remember when I was interviewing in like some of the FANG, the big tech companies, sometimes they'll fly you out there for two to three days of interviews. And you're exhausting. You're like, uh, and they'll oftentimes do six to seven hours a day. So any any tips there on how to how to succeed at long days of interviews? Yeah, preparation is key. Um, obviously, coordinating off your schedule, whether you're flying somewhere in person or it's just kind of a one day interview. Obviously, do not plan anything else for that particular day. It's always great to try to schedule those interviews in the morning when we are the freshest and most um, awake and and kind of functioning mentally, um, because that's when you're going to do your best, best kind of work. So I think preparation the day before is really key. Make sure that all your materials are printed, bring extra copies of your resume, make sure, you know, whatever you're wearing is um, ready to go on the day of, make sure that you bring snacks with you. You know, hopefully, especially you'll, you'll know in advance whether or not any portion of your interview will be over a mealtime, um, those kinds of things about whether or not you'll be fed, bring snacks with you, bring your own water. Most employers will offer you that. They're, they're nice and hospitable, but always kind of become prepared for, for your backups. But then I just say, focus on one interview at a time. You'll hopefully have your interview schedule. It's not worth it to kind of get really nervous about that last interview. You want to think about, okay, who am I meeting with? What order am I meeting with? And um, who are they in the organization? And say kind of, you know, ask to use the restroom, take a little bit of a break as you need it. Hopefully an employer is building in breaks for you as well, just to kind of gather um, your wits about you. But again, preparation really is key. Take it interview by interview, focus on that person's role, the questions that they're asking you, and then just kind of proceed from one interview to the next. Yeah, I would say that my my biggest realization moment was that if someone's flying you out for 16 hours of interviews, they are pretty committed to your success as well. Right? Right. And so they want to make it work. So, you know, have, having that mindset oftentimes is, it doesn't feel so like they're, they're, you don't feel so put upon, right? You feel like um, they're committing 16 hours of their time to making, seeing if I'm a right fit for them, right? So it is a, um, it's, it's a dating process and they're, they're, they're showing up too, right? So, all right. Thank you, Emily. Let's dive into our next uh, question or the next topic, the three most common non-technical questions, right? So um, typically we'll say these are like behavioral questions are, uh, and then what are good answers for these? Yeah, so I think the first one that we focus on is why are you interested in this role? 
um, and in this organization. I think people, going back to what you said, it is it is like dating. People want to know that you're invested in there. So I think a great answer to this question focuses on highlighting, um, you know, if you're interested in the mission of the organization, if you're interested in financial services, why do you think technology exists in financial services? If you're looking at nonprofits, what is it about that nonprofit that speaks to you? Um, like I mentioned earlier with the example of our Grace Hopper alum, who was a farmer, she was really looking for organizations that spoke to that mission drivenness that she had in herself for sustainability and, and agriculture. So she was looking for organizations that resonated um, with that. And then one of the things I love to ask, why are you interested in this role and, and the organization is because you can say, you know, I've seen these are really cool projects that you're working on. I've seen you develop, have developed these product um, products that have gone to market or that you work with these particular clients and, and provide technology solutions for them. Um, so kind of, you know, highlighting some of those things is really important um to an employer and another thing is too we've seen a lot of our full stack academy students go to companies where our alums have been hired so we know that there's a mentorship component attached to it we know that those organizations care a lot about the development of our of our alums post program and it's really great to see that there is that support which i think is something that that they highlight a lot during their interview process Awesome. So the first question was, why didn't you just roll? Uh, oh, what about this question? Number two is, why did you decide to do a boot camp? What are they trying to What are they trying to figure out? And what's, how do you get to that underlying answer? Yeah, when I think when employers are asking that question, they want to understand how self aware a student is. They want to understand, um, you know, why did you might decide to make what might, could be a really you know big pivot for you. You might be leaving an industry. You might have been leaving a stable job. Um, they want to understand kind of what your thought process was around this. So some of the things that we you know encourage students to talk about is what they wanted to get out of a boot camp about what they went in. Why did they decide to choose that over maybe going back to undergrad or doing a you know another two or four year program? So I think you know the first thing that we highlight is that it shows commitment to the field that they're they're focused to being focused on being an engineer at this stage in their career because they understand that it's what's right for them and they want to make sure that they get the education and the experience to be successful and and saw that that will happen best for them um, in a boot camp. We also see students talk about how you know, boot camp education has really sped up their process of being able to solve technical problems. Because of the full stack curriculum, students are launched immediately into pair programming, solving challenges, building projects, and in a short amount of time is that you're identifying that you're problem solving oriented and that you really want that skill set to move on and solve the next couple of problems. And then I think from a self-awareness perspective, it shows an investment in yourself when you decide to do a boot camp, I think higher education or extended education of any kind is an investment in yourself. And I think it shows that you were looking in the field and looking at the education options that existed um, for you and that were available for you. And you're choosing the one that's going to get you results the quickest in the boot camp environment because it's so quick and kind of down and dirty in its in its focus. Students really get the skill sets that they need to then enter uh, the workplace. Um, and then I think the one I think that makes the most, um, that touches me the most, I think, is the fact that the community and camaraderie that exists within a boot camp environment really speaks to a lot of our students, especially um, our in-person programs. You know you're not doing it alone. You know you're doing it with people who thought exactly the same way that you did, and you get to go through this experience with with friends, with teachers, with instructors who have all been in your shoes before, and something about that experience really resonates with you. I think, uh, yeah, oftentimes, I, I like those answers, like the, and then one other thing I would, I would win is sometimes I think people want to live vicariously through you, right? Because if, you know, if someone who's, um, when I think when I was a programmer, I, that's all I ever knew. And so I was programming day in, day out. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great job, but it, it oftentimes, you know, it's the, the kind of the grass is greener effect. You're like, well, you came from this and now you, you're jumping in here. The, uh, tell me what gave you the, uh, what gave you that thought of jumping into into this field and, and taking that big leap? I think there's a little bit of living vicariously through that person. And it is interesting oftentimes, you know, one thing that is so personally recharging for me is working with students because they're, they're so, um, I don't, I don't, they're so excited about things that I wouldn't say is that taken for granted, but things that I've stopped seeing sometimes the magic of. 
and working with, prog- with with computers and programming, it is like the closest thing I think there is to um, like modern day magic that there is, right? It's so, like you can make these these magic boxes do all kinds of funny stuff, and um, and so I think I think there is a little bit of like you know if you're if you're positive about that, you can sometimes you sometimes bring back that that feeling of wow. The, almost like appreciation of how cool this field is and how lucky we are to be alive in this, uh, in this time. So I think, you know, having that excitement is also something else that, um, that pr- at least programmers can also really key into. Yeah, definitely. And this question we get a lot, or we hear a lot is, uh, tell me how you deal with, cl- with conflict. What are, what are they trying to figure out about you and, and what's a good answer? Yeah, look, we go to work with people every day, whether you're in remote capacities, whether you're in person with that. So this is a question that that gets asked often um, because they want to know. You're not going to agree with everyone all the time on projects and, and problems that you're working on. So employers really want to dive deep into understanding, are you going to be someone who can identify a conflict and then figure out ways to reconcile so that the team and the project can move forward? So our students often answer this by using their capstone um, because this is a group project. So they have to work together not only to identify the idea that they're going to be working on, how they're going to build it, who's going to do what. Inevitably, you know, you reach the end of our program. We usually have capstone projects presented, um, you know, week 16, week week 17. Everybody's a little tired. Everybody's a little cranky. You're emotional because you're also coming to the end of this experience. And that's really where conflict kind of does come up because you may have decided you wanted to use one language. Somebody else wanted to use something else. How did you reconcile? Um, that. But I think it's also important to understand that our students also in their previous professional experiences probably also dealt with conflict. You know, we've got former teachers who have spoken to us about what it's like to break up fights in in their classroom. We've got former team managers who have had to manage conflict within their own employees working on other teams um, that they were in. So really the conflict question is, is how do you collaborate? How do you work with other people? And how can you move forward when you know you need to in the best interest of the project that you're working on? Awesome. All right, uh, let's, let's let's go through um, our kind of eight tips and tricks for, for the virtual interview. Yeah. Um, well, we can just go back and forth on them because I think, you know, so uh, I'll start off. I think the, the first thing is uh, make sure you have good internet. and and what I mean by that is that even something as as um, like plugging directly into your router, you know, you can buy an Ethernet dongle on Amazon for like five dollars, right? So get an Ethernet US, USB to Ethernet dongle, and then plug the wire directly into your router. That way, it guarantees that you know, versus your roommates, everyone streaming Netflix and downloading torrents, you're getting the highest priority traffic. So that's something that is important because. Um, you know, it's like we assume most times it's pretty good, but you don't want to be the person who's like videos cutting in and out, whose audio is not good. So make sure you have good internet. I highly recommend plugging directly into the uh, into the router if you can. Yeah, definitely. The next tip is dress as you would normally. Um, obviously, this is an interview. If you if you would be going in person um, to this interview, you would have that best outfit on. So pressed shirt, a tie, a blouse, a sweater, whatever you feel most comfortable and confident in, make sure that that's how you're dressed when you're sitting at the table talking um, to to the employer. You can be business on top and, and casual <laughs> on the bottom. But obviously, yeah. Don't make the mistake of standing up during the interview and letting everyone kind of see your Snoopy um, pajama pants. So I always tell everyone, just put the whole outfit on. One thing you won't have to worry about is getting up and, and kind of making that mistake. It's funny. the uh, like So I, I always wear shorts because that's my, at least, at least shorts, because that's my greatest fear is like I'm in a Zoom call and I would stand up and it's like you just walk around your boxers and like a, a business shirt. Um, I know that, I know TV anchors do that. You know, they're suit yeah. on top and just like wearing, because it's hot in this studio. So yeah, I recommend just, you know, getting dressed up as, as you would normally. Um, also, you just feel different when you when you have belt on and all of us have not had belt on for probably about a month. So it's a... Uh, it's um. Oh, I saw something. It's like do, you should put your jeans on just just to check whether or not the last month has been uh, you know, good or bad for for quarantine <laughs> diets. Uh, I feel like most people who've been baking bread probably think it's they got to belt that that loop one one little tighter a little bit. I think. Yeah. What happened to all the gluten free? I was like before pandemic, everything was gluten free, and now everyone's baking sourdough bread. So I don't know. You know, um, it's p- pandemic diets. I guess. I definitely. Um, three. I would say you know. This is it's a very kind of common thing is that people can deal with bad video, but it's really, really annoying to deal with bad audio. And so um, 
definitely don't i would say see if you can get headsets if possible something like airpods if you get wireless things one thing that you don't want or if you get wired headphones one thing you don't want is it scratching on your um you, you kind of get this sound right which is really annoying so try to um get wireless headphones or headphones where you're wired you make sure you're one thing i do is i oftentimes will take a binder clip and and clip my my wire away from my clothing um so that's, that's another thing is to focus on your sound and test it because sound is more important than than video for people's processing of, of how they perceive you yeah absolutely i'm actually going to use that trick because i use i use plug-in headphones and i feel like i've been scratching all over the place the last couple of weeks yeah it can be really annoying because it's like it's it's you don't hear it at all as a talker but to people outside it sounds like a very deep bass like bass sound hitting your ear yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next tip is pay attention to how the employer is speaking. There obviously can be, hopefully, if you've got good internet, you know, everything's kind of seamless. You hear everybody talking to you. But remember, there can be a lag between when the employer finishes talking and when you should start talking. You just don't want to talk over the employer. So make sure you're actively listening, um, watching their cues, and looking for that pause when they're ready for you to, to answer the question they just asked. Yeah, that's a great tip. Uh, the next one is make sure your background is clean and represents rep represents who you are uh probably not following my own rule i got, I got a treadmill here I, I don't even know what that red thing is it's like a punching bag so uh, people understand you know you're at your home you're probably not but try to make it as clean as possible uh it is um you know you don't want to be too messy so clean up the background behind you if it's in zoom you know zoom has those virtual backgrounds trying to be too goofy i think those are um they're fun but they can be very distracting so just i think a clean background is better yeah i i, I definitely appreciate my kind of guitar studio back here yeah. it's where i've been sitting for the past past couple of weeks none of these are used by me they're just really here for decorative purposes it's a great conversation starter right have something behind you um what should, what should i get behind me maybe i'll get you know it's funny this is i'm in my my uh my mother's home and there's all these like this is like our the trophy room from my high school day so i'm these are the glory days of my high school here so you know. all the old david yang swag yeah the old david yang um news articles and stuff yeah definitely. um all right uh, the um okay yeah. The so, next tip is definitely make sure you have your resume um, ready to send or screen share. So you can create like a little bit.ly link. You can definitely share your screen with an employer. Hopefully most employers in the virtual environments will realize that they have to have your resume up so that they can take a look at it because they won't have you being able to produce the paper copy like you would in person. So always just make sure you've either got a PDF, you can email them really quickly, the bit.ly link to, to share or a quick, a yeah. quick screen share. I think one power tip for this is I, I, I love having like kind of cool URLs for simple things. So I'm like, if someone's like, hey, do you have a link to your resume? Or can you send me your resume? I just say, oh, go check out davidyang.com slash resume, right? And then that is just a redirect link. Um, or, or bit.ly, it's just like bit.ly slash David Yang's resume. So uh, make it easy for them to, to get to it. it. Just It looks like you think about your, your personal branding. Yeah, absolutely. All right, the next one is uh, setting up your camera. I think one thing is that the... You know, we're all kind of in new environments right now. We have our laptops mostly on our lap or on a desk. Uh, that creates this kind of appearance of looking up, which is just less flattering than having something looking sideways or looking straight up at you. So I would get some books at the minimum and put your laptop uh, where your camera is kind of looking down on you. So anyone who's ever done a profile photo and like shot their, you know, that photo look where it's really looking down on you, emphasize your jawline, exact same tip, right? So um, get, get your camera face to face is much better than having it look up at you, uh, up into your nostrils. So um, audio first, but then get the video looking as good as you can. Yeah, and then this one is a little old school as well. Make sure you have um, a pen and a paper handy for you so that you can take notes on what the employer is saying to you. Keyboard clicking, so if you're taking notes um, on your keyboard, can be distracting and you can it's actually- very loud sometimes, yeah. right? Like super loud and you can actually miss some of the things the employer says to you because you're so concentrating on typing and you know backspacing and not making mistakes as opposed to just being able to take some really quick notes um, the old school way. Yeah, awesome. All right, so that's eight virtual interview tips and tricks. This has been a great session um, and great, great talking to you, Lesha, and uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, for all of you watching in the future, you know, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the comments. We'll we keep an eye on all this stuff. And um and yeah, and best of luck out there. I mean, we are all in a new world right now and all exploring different ways to make things work. And I think that hiring is something that 
it's core to every business's it's core to every business so every business is figuring it out and these are just our thoughts on how to make it as as seamless and effective as possible yeah absolutely david thank you for having me this was great and and i echo everything you said and again if there are any employers out there who are looking for um junior dev talent please reach out to me um we've got our upcoming hiring days in new york and chicago and for our cybersecurity boot camp um, and what's the best way to get in touch with, to, to, best way to get in touch with you is email flesha.harhai at fullstackacademy.com all right check that out okay thanks so much everyone and thanks, uh we'll talk to you soon